Welcome everyone um, to our summer webinar series for the Knowledge Portal Platform and Workshop. Um, I'm Noelle Bird, for those of you who don't know me. Um, we're gonna get started today, just a couple housekeeping notes. We'll be recording this and it'll be on all the production portals um, a couple days after we do this, once we get it you know, a little cleaner um, that you can refer to. We'll also post it on Twitter so you can see it there. Um, excuse me, my dog barker's here, great timing. <laughs> um, and then um, we'll also be doing um, a future webinars and I'll give that, get to that in a minute. But if you have any questions during this time, um, please post them in the Q&A down below. You'll see Q&A and we'll do them um, as we go if we can. Um, if not, we'll save them to the bitter end um, to go through them. So give me one second, I'm just going to hand up the dog and then we'll get started. <laughs> the joys of working at home. <laughs> Thanks for the patience everyone. All right, fantastic. All right, can you, everyone hear me? Maria, can you just nod if you can hear me? All right. That's good. That's good. All right, so I'm gonna get started and then I'll hand it over to Maria who's gonna do the lion's share of the presentation today. And um, what I love about this particular webinar is today will be an interactive demo and allow you to follow along if you so choose. It also really is a feature that's brand spanking new. Uh, we want feedback on it. It's actively being developed, added to both data and feature. So it's one of the things we really love because it's something that we can work with you to get your feedback on and make better in real time. So that's really the focus of our conversation today. But first, I wanna sort of walk you through um, what's been going on with the Common Metabolic Disease Knowledge Portal and, and where we are overall. So, um, let's get to my slide. There we go. So today I'll update you on where we are with the Common Metabolic Disease Knowledge Portal, the beta launch and the eventual rollout to the production um, portal. And then Maria, as I mentioned, is gonna talk about the Region Explorer demonstration, which I think is a marketing feature for the future of the portal. But as you know, we are still maintaining our production portals, um, and we just had a July release that went out, uh, I think, 24 hours ago. Uh, again, this is updating many of the production portals that are out there right now. Um, we do these um, every other month, so you should get used to these and continue to do these as we cut over to the Common Metabolic Disease Knowledge Portal. But I just want to give you a little highlight if you are currently working on any of the types of IBs portals, the CBD portal, the cardiovascular portal, the sleep um, or cerebral vascular portal with some new data sets to check out. Um, specifically, we're really focusing on glycemic and type 2 diabetes complications. We have an AMD um, data set that's now up on the portal. We've focused on non-European ancestries also for this particular release and some stratification by smoking and other genotypes that will be of interest to complications for type 2 diabetes. There's also a UK biobank analysis um, called GERA, uh, contributed by Joseph Mekador. Uh, collaborative ours that many of you know. It's 22 age-related diseases um, that's also hosted on the portal and a bioarchive um, manuscript you can tandem to that that you can check out. Cerebrovascular disease also has a nice data set update for ischemic stroke outcomes. Um, this is three-month follow-up. It's a very nice data set also available on both the Common Metabolic Disease Knowledge Portal and the Cerebrovascular Portal. Sleep also has an update this quarter um, with some circadian traits, ease of waking up, snoring GWAS, and um, some circadian rhythm to us. We also have added some anthropometric traits that are very relevant for obesity um, and to the portal that you can also query on the type diabetes portal. So what this means is to, as of July this month, this is sort of our last data freeze on the current four production portals that are out there. Going forward, we'll be transitioning to the new framework that I'm gonna share with you today, and Maria's gonna talk about some features. We've had a couple webinars to do this, but right now the portal is available to you um, in beta version, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit now. So really what the Common Metabolic Disease Knowledge Portal is aimed to do is, is really expand on our simple idea. So the last six years or so, you know, really what we've been trying to do in the genetics of types of diabetes and moreover in, in common metabolic disease is make genetic and related genomic data more broadly accessible so that hopefully we can have an impact on human disease and biology. The goal there is to bring relevant genetic data sets, GWAS sequencing, together with annotations and layer them in a way that a user who is not an expert in the field can make sense of them. And really we started with genetic data because that's our wheelhouse and the production portals that you see now, the diabetes, cerebrovascular, sleep, and CBDKP all have that as its core component. Genetic data really is its, you know, the, the, the food that, that powers them. But as we move forward, we have hundreds of GWAS loci in many of these data sets, I mean diseases. And so it's really critical for us as a, as, a, as a platform and as a community to shift to function. We're very good at representing genetic data sets, but really in many of these places, you just have it locus. You know, for AFib, you have 100 loci. For types of diabetes, you have over 400 loci. For cardi 
coronary artery disease, you have 200 loci. You don't necessarily know the gene, the variant, the regulatory effect, or in what tissue. So our goal with the portal shifting over the coming years is to help enable that, um, help you enable to determine what is the variant, the gene, the pathway, and the mechanism of action. So to do that, we have many things to do to prepare. One thing that's in our favor is that, you know, over the past couple of years, the technological and computational advancements in the field have made it so there are foundational resources at our disposal to help bring this to bear. Um, however, we need to house them and catalog and integrate them into a resource that can be easily accessible. And that's really what Maria is going to focus on today. She's going to focus on the accessibility of an integrated resource where, you know, you can get many of these things in different places, but you really want a place where they're all together in a way that you can visualize them. And that's really the simple idea that we're trying to shift to in the coming years. Because, you know, I think with this, with genetic data, there were a set of uh, questions we had to address. You know, where data are housed, there's many different access mechanisms. The same challenge applies here. However, they're a little bit more complex. We need to know what data types are needed and what types help us validate the results we see. What information must be retained? We learned this in the GWAS era in terms of what you had to retain to represent results accurately on a portal. Now we need to do this for a tax sequence and so on and so forth. Um, for the methods, what there are a host of computational approaches to be run on GWAS data and other types of data types annotations that need to be coupled and run systematically in order to make any inferences. So we want to you know, build the platform such that we can easily incorporate methods identify the right ones and validate them appropriately so the results that we represent to you are useful. Then moreover, once you have all these methods, different data types, you need to have a way to express the relationships as an output you can actually make sense of, whether it's a visualization, whether it's a table, whether it's an access mechanism. Those are the challenges we're trying to address. And some of the simple ways we're starting to do that in this, short, in this current year are to stage the platform such that we can, we can take on these, these new opportunities. So specifically, we're aiming to expand the data and platform, software plan for to respond to both the wealth and diversity of new data incoming. We want to create a common resource for complex metabolic diseases because, let's face it, when you want to understand types of diabetes, you need to also understand lipids, you need to understand types of um, obesity traits, you need to understand what's going on for those variants, or those loci, and these other relevant traits. Also, you want to make sure that the resource is as powerful as possible. So you want to maintain and bring together multiple communities who have contributed to this. Then you need to erect a new framework that is far more fast and efficient. If any of you have been on the Types of IBS Knowledge Portal, it's a little slow. You want to make it fast, more nimble, and represent the right results. Another thing that we're doing to preparing is to really take you along for the journey, to listen and teach, and to talk to our users about what are you using, what aren't you using, um, how does this work? And today is really one of those, one, one, one effort in that area, and that we really want to just have you see this, this, this new, new feature and tell us what you think about it. So to that end, there were some guiding principles. Many of these portals were started from a grassroots effort from a disease community, types of diabetes, through the vascular sleep disorders, and cardiovascular, where basically they wanted a means, they a community of consortia or intrepid scientists, wanted a means to represent their own results in a way that is you know, validated by that community, but also open access to anybody, such that someone who's in an industry setting, a basic biologist, could have access to the results and not have to download from five different sites, put them together, understand R, and, and have some sort of way of visualizing them. Very simple means that really brought this portal together, these portals. Um, and so we wanted to retain some of that. We wanted to retain the fact that these communities that spend a lot of sweat equity bringing these data together set, data sets to us can maintain sort of that footprint. So we want to maintain the community representation of the current portals. We want to allow all the existing URLs that are out there to maintain so that you know, papers that were published a year ago, or two years ago even, can redirect to the new resource as we build it. This is all powered by the AMP TGD resource that we've been building um, at its grassroots for type diabetes, but we've been able to expand to other disease areas. It's the same software platform, the same data, and the same methods. It's all a common integrated resource. We want to build a sing single means of representing that resource in the common metabolic disease space, housing all the data, all the methods, and all the relevant features. And finally, if we do this right, we can engage a water disease community and experts in that community to help us identify the best data sets, represent the best genetic and genomic data, data types on this portal, and really um, capitalize on the community that we developed in these smaller communities, bringing them together into one. 
that's really the guiding principle for the common metabolic disease knowledge portal. And we're very lucky to work with a set of collaborators who have been wonderful, um, that's an understatement, to build these portals in their specific disease areas on the same platform, but really customize it for the things that matter to them. So we want to retain that. And so you've heard about many of these portals before, but I'm going to talk about how that's all subsumed into one resource. So as of now, you can um, peruse the beta version of the common metabolic disease resource. It again, brings together type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, and sleep disorder into one warehouse. I'm going to do a brief tour of that because um, past couple webinars, we've been doing um, demos of this, but I know several of you may have not been able to make that. And Maria is going to then show you a specific tool within this, but I'm just going to orient you a little bit to the overall structure of the resource. First of all, the most important thing from my perspective is the integrity of the data within. All data sets are available for query in the common resource, and these now total 309 traits across 154 data sets. And all the information, so all the provenance, all the documentation, all the proper citations, the analysis protocols where available are all tracked and aggregated here, but you can then you can see from which community they came from right here if you want to know that the community contributing to them is still retained. We're also, as we're expanding to common metabolic diseases, we need a more reasoned ontology because it's a host more traits as you can see. So we're going to be um, using the EFO um, te uh, terminology so that you can link out to whatever that, that particular trait name, but also have a very specific reasoned ontology in the new, new framework that will be a little bit more useful um, as we expand into traits. That's a couple of things about data. So here's the portal. It looks very similar to what you're used to, but what I want to show you is a couple orienting things as we go through. So you notice one thing right off the bat, portal's hopefully faster. But what Maureen's going to show you is a specific feature, but just a couple anchoring things. So what I mentioned about the disease-specific portals. This is the common metabolic disease knowledge portal. So it's the resource that houses everything. But if you would like to work in the space of, say, just cardiovascular disease, if you pick that, it'll bring you to the exact same framework, but specifically for cardiovascular disease. So you have all the methods, tools, and features, but you have just the cardiovascular community, community data sets at your disposal to query. You'll have this for all the other common metabolic disease knowledge portal, um, open access portals that are in the framework. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is you can easily go back out to the resource whenever you want. But these two features right here, phenotypes, genes, and reason variants, cover the entire gamut of the common metabolic disease knowledge portal framework. So when you're here, you're searching across all the data sets within that resource. So Maria's going to talk to you a little bit about that. But what I wanted to show you is just how to orient yourself to so phenotypes. This is, you know, basically a way for you to search any phenotype that you would like within the common type, um, common, oops, there you go within the common knowledge, common metabolic disease knowledge portal. So it's a lot faster, and here's what you're going to see. You're going to see your QQ plots and Manhattan plots right off the bat. And this is a little bit different than you're used to. You're going to see the bottom line results. What's elegant about this is if you have multiple data sets for a given phenotype, right now in the portal, you'll see a list of all the different data sets that contribute to that. You really want to know what's the bottom line result. What's the best p-value? And this method helps you do that. This helps you say, like, for all the data sets we have types of diabetes, calculate me the bottom line p-value. And what's nice about this is it accounts for sample overlap. So if there's a sample in this study and a sample in this study for the same trait, we're counting for that. So we're not double counting. Um, and it allows you to have a like, sort of an at-a-glance sense of the genome-wide associations for that given trait. We've shown this to you before, and I'm not going to walk through these in grave detail today because I want to save time for Maria's demo, but this gives you a sense of what the new framework looks like. If you want to see the top associations, they're right here in the directionality of effect. But you can also, if you'd like to drill down to specific data sets within, each, uh, within the bottom line analysis for a given phenotype, they're at your disposal here. This is a quick little, and this is also the global enriched annotations for types of diabetes also at your disposal on the phenotype page. So we have a marquee phenotype page. And the other mechanism of, action, of, of, of interaction with the portal is by a gene region or variant. This is something that's very similar to you. Here are the examples that we've put for you. But let's say you want to take a quick um, look at a region. So this is going to give you all the associations for a given region. It's going to default to the top association for that given region for the top phenotype within the portal. And it's going to give you a sort of an at-a-glance sense of for that region, for the genes that overlap in the region, what are the associations. And this is, again, by this sort of 
reasoned ontology based on common metabolic diseases where you can see what traits are associated with this given region and the other ones that are nominally associated. And this will allow you to peruse each of these if you so choose. And here's where you can drill down into the classic locus zoom plot for coronary artery disease, which is something you're familiar with, and the top associations. And this, we'll get to in a minute, is what we'll, Maria, the source of what Maria is going to be talking about for you. So in future webinars, we're going to be demoing this. But what's important right now is we want you to test it. We want you to take a look at it. We want you to tell you what you like, what you don't like about it. Because right now, we're in the development phase. And we're hoping to roll this out to, in the formal release um, in the next month or so. So I'm talk, let me switch back to my slide and talk a little bit about that. So now, so for many of you who have spent a lot of time in the portal, this is really, really valuable to you. What we did was we took all the missing features. So all the current features as we know them in the portal, we've listed them here. And these are features that, you know, we know them by their name and they're useful to you. We wanted to sort of call them out. So as of now, anything in the sort of this, you know, this reddish orange color is not currently in the beta version. Anything that's listed as yes, obviously is. And some of the green ones are the only ones that are coming on. So the annotation tracks and the credible sets and the ones Maria is gonna speak about specifically in this new tool. But a couple of the features that are really useful to you are not currently there. So that's really why I wanted to focus on those. So if you're perusing the portal and you're like, oh, my favorite feature isn't there, why isn't it? I'll just give you a little heads up. So the variant finder is one of our features that I think our industry partners really love. Um, and I think we really want to keep, but we want to re-envision it so it's more useful and more flexible. So this is a great feature where you want to say, you know, you want to specify, specify a set of criteria and filters for a variant and set of phenotypes. You know, if you're looking for something associated with type diabetes and a host of other common metabolic diseases or complications, this is what you want to use. It's a customizable feature. It's currently not available in the Common Metabolic Disease Knowledge Portal. We hope by August it will be. Another one that many of you used to for type diabetes, I just wanted to highlight here, see uh, predicted of THD effector genes. The reason that's not in there is because we have some wonderful work we're doing with, with several collaborators to bring in new prediction algorithms, new prediction methods, and new results. So we'll have three of those coming online over the course of the next couple of weeks that you will see come onto the portal. That's one thing that if you go to the portal right now, you will not see. Another key feature that many people like and is sort of a hallmark of what we've done with um, the Types of IBs portal is conditional interactive analysis or a gate tool where you can use actual individual level data in the firewall and compute um, burden tests based on you know, phenotypic filter, fil filters and SNF filters and get results bounced back to you, never um, uncovering the individual level data. So this is a very cool feature we've had, particularly for our exomes um, that we don't currently have, but we will redirect everyone to that function and allow you to have that um, for future iterations of the portal. But that's gonna be um, re-envisioned and re-imagined and hopefully um, coming online in the fall, we will allow non-coding burning tests using whole genome data from TopMed. So that's a feature that's really got some legs in the future, but right now it's on hold because we want to build it for the future, not just have a stopgap for the current, current needs. So that's another feature. So I want to sort of call your attention to some of these things where you may want to look for them and not see them. Um, but as of the end of July, a lot of things will be there that are not currently there. We'll have the gene level associations, we'll have the predicted TGD effector genes, We'll have pre-computer results from GATE. And we'll also have that genes and reagent tab that many of you like, which is, gives you some computational evidence for which gene in a given type, um, given low side might be most valuable to follow up. Just giving you different things like MedX scan, depict, things like that. Those results will be available hopefully in the end of July with some methods coming more online in August. This is some high level structure, particularly for those of you who played with the type side views portal for for many years, I want to give you a sense of what's there and what's not, so you're not confused as you go to it. Moreover, there's a couple things that we're moving toward. So as you can see, as we move towards having a lot of data sets, you're not going to want to have um, a page that lists you the p-value for every individual level data set. That's you know, a little dense, and that's something that where a person who's a wet lab biologist is never going to want to use or understand. So what, that's why we built in the bottom line module, which gives you for a given phenotype, it subsumes all the results into one meta-analysis p-value that accounts for sample overlap. However, we also know that there are very specific data sets that are on the portal that are contributed by the community that you want to be always able to drill down into the top results for given phenotypes. I think that's a valuable thing we do not want to get rid of, even as we move towards a more um, 
interactive portal that allows you to, you know, um, sort of see high level genetic data with genomic annotations. You still want to allow a user to drill down to the genetic data sets that, that go into um, the results we represent. So for that, we're building something called the Dataset Inspector, which will come in line in, Ju in July, um, but it's not there currently. What it allows you to see is, in addition to the data sets page, which gives you all the information about how the cohorts were collected, the phenotype was done, the analyses were done, the citations, you know, basically describes the analyses done, you also can view the genome-wide association results for that view any of the post-processing methods, the results for that. In fact, even downstream, we're hoping to enable download of individual level GWAS post-processing processing method results for a given data set. We think this would be very interested, interesting to you know, collaborators we have who have submitted to us data sets for sharing upon publication. If we run a method across it, we would like to make sure that they can have those results back. And also it may be valuable to the community. And this is a new feature that we really feel will sort of get at the genetic um, communities that are con contributing data going forward. Another really cool feature I want to mention, it's not really a feature, it's a new community, um, the NIDDK's commitment to diabetes continues and commitment to this effort continues. Um, we are working with um, Steve Rich and Kyle Galton to build a type 1 diabetes knowledge portal. And if you notice, when I did the demo, that portal is actually available in a prototype form. Um, no new data is on it currently. We've just lifted over relevant data um, that's already in the type 2 diabetes portal relevant to type 1. Um, there's a thin gen study as well for type 1 diabetes, and I can peruse it. But what's nice is that this is an active um, activity that's going to be going on for several years now where we're going to be building type 1 diabetes data sets into the portal. So in the next couple of weeks, you'll see some new data sets popping up there that ha have not been publicly available elsewhere. So that'll be exciting. So that you can look for that coming soon. So that's the Common Metabolic Disease Knowledge Portal. And before I turn it to Maria, I just wanted to mention, you know, there are other portals and other diseases, which we've been very blessed to work with other like-minded communities who've been interested in making their results um, publicly available, but also, you know, <laughs> enabling scientists to understand, you know, what variant or locus you might study, a gene you might study from a given locus. So for this, you know, we also have um, a, a website that powers all our knowledge portals, allows you to get to all the other knowledge portals. We're giving that a new look coming soon, but what's really most important from this is that we've worked with other communities. So if you want to understand musculoskeletal disease, we've worked with Douglas Keel and the IMFRS, um, who generously donated to us to build with the bone disease community um, a new resource for musculoskeletal disease. And we launched that in March. I think I mentioned this the web last webinar. It's already got 1,500 users. And we're very lucky that the osteoarthritis community has joined the effort and this will, they will contribute more results over time. And one of the things that this, this community cares specifically about is you know, omics data, layering of other omics types. And really what's been neat, neat about this, you know, this constellation of portals is each community kind of has a different sort of lens on what data sets or methods they might value. And that's been really valuable to us because that helps us build the overall composite resource to be more attuned to the broader needs. So for example, they really care about expression data. And expression data is something that we don't have a means to visualize currently on the portal. And so we'll be working with them, for example, to bring in expression data that is relevant to you know, cell types for musculoskeletal disease and build ways to represent those and sort of heat maps and other ways that we don't currently have. That's what's really wonderful about having these communities. Also, you know, this is also helping us understand, you know, the loci for musculoskeletal disease more broadly. Same thing with lung disease. Um, we're building a portal with Michael Cho and Benjamin Raby for lung disease, which has not launched yet. We hope it will to launch this, this summer, um, but obviously um, many people in the lung disease world are, are distracted with other things that are more important right now, so <laughs> we're a bit holding up on that. But again, this will be open access, same tools, same features, different data sets, but they care, for example, they will be bringing in EQTL results, and they care about visualizations for that. So we'll be focused on you know, working with them to develop visualizations for EQTLs in the context of lung disease. Those visualizations will be made available on the common metabolic disease resource. So all resources will sort of gain from the community's um, investment in data types and data sets that they care about particularly. So, we continue to do this. We want to expand our, you know, our, our, our network of people that we can talk to about the, the platform and, and the portals. We do this every other month. Um, the next one's going to be in September, and then the following one will be in November. We'll publicize these and you can make sure that you can join. I hope you can. Rollout. One more thing before a piece. So 
we want to make sure that the current sites are always functional so that that won't change nothing will it will appear seamless to you as a user in terms of like urls um, we're hoping somewhere around august 15th to do what i call a phase out that sounds scary but it's really not which basically will mean at a certain point all the current urls that you're used to for the cerebrovascular cardiovascular sleep disorder and type diabetes will redirect to the new framework that i showed you so for example, if you go from type diabetes to type diabetes, you'll go to type two diabetes inside of the common metabolic disease knowledge portal. This will allow us to have a seamless redirect, but also allow communities to have the same space to say, you know, this is where our data are housed. And we'll be doing training and feedback throughout this time. We're also gonna add some nice little, you know, little, little uh, buttons to some of our features to say, do you like this and don't you? Because we wanna make it really easy for you to give us feedback. You can always just email me, <laughs> you know, we're still a small shop. But I'm really thankful. Um, it's again a great group of people that um, come to work every day. Well, not anymore, <laughs> but stay at home and work really hard um, to build this portal. And particularly right now, the summer has been a wildly busy time for us as we build a new resource, but also try and um, you know add in all these different data types and work with our, our colleagues at DGA as well to bring in these new data sets and representations. So this is also the broader team for AMP that helps develop the portal and the resource, and then the AMP partnership without this we, we would not be doing this so i'm very thankful and now i'm going to turn it over to maria and maybe save questions for the end um just given the sense of time okay um so before going to the live demo i just wanted to uh, briefly review some of the data types that we have um, in the portal so everyone's clear on them um, and basically there are three um, genetic association data sets of course functional genomic annotations and results of bioinformatic methods and i'll talk about each one in a little bit of detail Oh gosh, okay. I'm sorry, I'm getting used to my computer setup here. There we go. Okay, so um, genetic associations, of course, are the foundations of the foundation of the knowledge portals. And we want to aggregate the largest and most authoritative data sets for each of the disease areas. And um, as Noel mentioned, that I think this includes T1D um, coming soon. Um, and also the, the four disease areas of the, the cardiometabolic portals. Um, <clears throat> so we want to aggregate um, summary level uh, association data, of course, and also credible sets, which um, are um, sets of variants which are predicted with a certain defined probability of including the causal variant for um, disease risk. So here's a summary of the association data that we have uh, right now in the CMDKP. Um, we've got 144 association, I'm sorry, 154 association data sets covering 309 traits. And um, these ones highlighted here are just some notable um, recently added um, and large samples that, that uh, data sets that we have. Um, we also have credible sets for 40 traits. So for T2D, we have the credible sets um, from Anupa Mahajan and coworkers um, that they calculated um, based on the Diamante European um, large T2D GWAS. Um, and then we also have credible sets for 40 traits, including T2D um, from Hillary Finnegan's lab. So, um, of course, genetic associations are, are um, fundamental to understanding complex diseases, but uh, by themselves, they're not really enough. Um, I mean, some variants, of course, if they interrupt a coding sequence and change a, a predicted protein sequence, um, that may uh, explain the reason for the, the effect on disease, and that's an uh, obvious avenue of further experimentation. But most variants are not, do not change protein coding sequences. And so, as Noel mentioned earlier, we have to figure out how, how they're acting, what are their target genes, um, what are the effector genes for the disease. And so to do this, of course, we need to add in functional uh, genomic data. And so that's our second data type. Um, and um, all of the, these types of data we add um, in, in concert with our, our sister portal, the Diabetes Epigenome Atlas, um, led by Kyle Galton and his team. And um, so they take in the raw data from all these different data types and process them and, and send them to us for display in the portal. So we are working together on this and we're also working together to um, decide which data sets to load to survey the, the literature and the, the you know, um, uh, ongoing research to prioritize which, which types of data would be most useful to add. So um, here I've listed just a few of the data types, these data types that we currently have in the portal. Of course, there are many, many data types 
not listed here, and uh, many of them are on our list um, for future edition, as Noel mentioned, so EQTL data, expression data, and many more. But I just wanted to go into a little bit of detail about the types that we have. So chromatin accessibility, this is um, a big one, um, determined by, for example, attack sequence, attack seek or DNA sequencing. Um, and this is just that when chromatin is open, not tied up in nucleosomes, it um, may be, uh, those areas of chromatin are more likely to be able to participate in regulation. And if a variant is in one of those open regions, it um, suggests that it might affect regulation. Um, there are also histone modifications, many different modifications, and the Chrome HMM algorithm uh, it takes these modifications and that looks at their patterns and from this predicts what are known as chromatin states. So for a particular region of the genome, uh, the chromatin state will be assigned um, that indicates its regulatory potential. For example, um, active enhancer or um, active transcription. Um, there's also, of course, transcription factor binding is um, an obvious uh, effect on regulation. Um, and there are predicted uh, TF binding sites, and then there are, of course, experimentally determined TF binding sites. Um, there are uh, chromatin conformation also uh, represented by these loops at the bottom of the, the figure here um, is uh, determining when two regions of chromatin that are, are distinct along, um, as in terms of genomic coordinates, actually physically contact other, each other through folding of the chromosome. And those um, types of interactions are, can also be regulatory when an enhancer contacts a promoter to, to regulate it. And um, so the um, PIC data um, indicates these kinds of interactions. And then there are several methods that take data like HIC and um, fold in more information and come out with a prediction of enhancer promoter interactions. So there's um, ABC, activity by contact, a method that was developed um, in Jesse Engritz's group. And we have those predictions. And then a couple of other methods are Cicero and Chicago. I'm not going to go into the details of, of how those methods work right now. But um, these are just all different ways of, of predicting these regulatory interactions. OK, here's an overview of the, this, the types of functional genomic annotations that we have right now in the portal. Um, so we've, and I forgot to mention in the previous slide that, of course, all of these annotations are tissue specific. You know, an enhancer in one might be in, active in one tissue, but would not be in, active in a different tissue. So there's a tissue component to all of them. And so the, we have annotated genomic regions from 125 different cell types, um, including all the data types that I just talked about. And then for, from the uh, enhancer promoter interaction methods, we have um, variant gene linkages in 88 tissues. So the ABC predictions were done for 84 cell types. Um, and then we also have um, some uh, predictions that were done based on uh, experimental work done in Kyle Galton's lab. Um, some uh, predicted enhancer promoter linkages uh, use, determined using the Cicero method, predicted from single nucleus attack seek in three different uh, pancreatic cell types. And we also have um, linkages predicted using Chicago from um, the high c method, high c data in pancreatic islets. Um, so, okay, the third data type that we have um, is the results of bioinformatic methods. And admittedly, there's some overlap between this category and the, the other one because all of the functional genomic annotations are, you know, have bioinformatic methods applied to them to some extent. So that it's a bit of an artificial distinction. But um, anyway, um, it, it's helpful to think about it this way sometimes. And there are a couple of methods that I want to focus on here. Um, one of them is meta-analysis of association statistics. And Noel mentioned this. Um, it's, um, the idea is that um, rather than looking at the associations from many data sets, and for example, for T2D, um, we may have 150 data sets that have associations for T2D risk. Um, how do you know which of these um, is you know, most reliable? How do you know which to, to use in your analysis? Um, we're, um, addressing this challenge by doing a meta-analysis of all of the data sets for each trait. And we're using the METAL method, which was developed by our colleagues at the University of Michigan. And it, as I think Noel mentioned also, it's, it's um, 
aware of sample overlap. So it, it takes care of that. So we don't double count when we do this analysis. And so the output of this is what we're calling a bottom line p-value for each um, variant trait association. And so a big difference between the CMDKP and, um, and the, the current production portals is that in the CMDKP, um, it, virtually every p-value you will see um, is a bottom line p-value. Um, and in the current portals, virtually every p-value that is shown is from one particular data set. Um, another method that I want to touch on briefly is um, enrichment analyses. Um, right now we're using the Gregor technique to do these analyses, but we're going to add um, more techniques that, that do um, a similar thing. So the idea here is that um, Gregor um, measures the enrichment of disease trait associations within regions that are functionally, um, that have functional annotations in a particular tissue. So it um, su can suggest which tissues are most um, important for a, a disease or a trait. And I'll show you in a minute in the live demo how, how we're showing that. So um, here's a summary of our bioinformatic methods then. Um, I didn't mention the variant effect predictor. This is from Ensemble, but it, it just gives um, a lot of predictions about a variant such as its consequences for um, proteins or for transcription. Then there's the bottom line analysis and the global enrichments, which right now is the Gregor method. So, okay, all together, this is a summary of um, what are the types of data that are integrated in the CMDKP. And then I'll just a really quick overview of, of how they get there. Um, so each class of data has um, a specific way that it's taken in, and some of the data comes through um, our, um, our group, and some of the data comes through the Diabetes Epigenome Atlas. Um, and then it all goes into our aggregator, um, which processes them, and uh, yeah, that's, You'd have to ask our engineers for the details about that. I really can't talk uh, authoritatively about that, but it works some magic. And um, then the results are displayed in the CMDKP resource. And so the aggregator um, is, is such that um, methods can be added to it and then um, just run on all of the data. So as I said, you know, we're, we're using Gregor now for enrichment. We'll probably be adding um, LD score regression in the future, and that can just be you know, put into the aggregator and then everything can be run through it. So it's, it's a very automated process that, that speeds everything up. Um, and then, um, yeah, here's a little more detail about some of what happens. The aggregator is powered by Hadoop and Spark. Um, and then in the CMDKP, we have this thing called the bioindex that indexes all of these data, which means that they can be pulled up and displayed on the website much, much faster than in the, the current production portals. So that's really important. Um, okay, and I have uh, another <laughs> reiteration of the acknowledgement slide. Our, our team is wonderful and it's great to work with everyone and everyone has worked really hard on this. Okay, so let me go out of that and get to a live demo. Okay, so you've already seen the homepage. <clears throat> And um, many people might want to start by looking at a particular phenotype of interest. So we'll click on the phenotype um, tab and start typing, and then you get a list of the choices that match your, your string. And uh, Noelle went over this page a bit, but I'm gonna go over in just a little bit more detail. Um, so, okay, at the top, an association plot, a Manhattan plot, you're all familiar with this, um, but I want to stress that this is showing those bottom line p-values that I, that I mentioned. So this is the, the consensus over all of the data sets that um, we have for this phenotype, coronary artery disease. Um, we've also added a QQ plot, which is um, kind of nice. You can check you know, the quality of the overall um, data set. So below that, uh, there's a table that um, just lists the top associations that are shown in, in the Manhattan plot. Um, and it's a, it's a filterable table. You can um, filter by the consequence of the variant. Um, you will be able to filter by the gene name. Look, this is something that's in progress, that we will have gene names, not ensemble IDs. And then at that point, you'll be able to type in a gene name and, and see 
the introns that are in, I'm sorry, the variants that are in those gene, that gene that you selected. Um, you can also filter by p-value, um, which is nice. Um, so you can add, and you can see how fast this all works too. Um, you can, you know, add any p-value threshold that you like, and you can also filter by direction of effect. So you see that the green arrows mean that these are all positive directions of effect, but you can choose to look at negative directions of effect if you like. Um, okay, and so uh, I've, I've been talking about the bottom line analysis, but um, how, you, how do you know which data sets went into that analysis? Well, this, this table lists it. So each uh, data set that had associations for the, this trait and which was meta-analyzed when it uh, is shown here. And then if you click on any one data set name, um, you get to a page. This is the, the future data set inspector page that Noel talked about. So right now it only has uh, you know, information about the data set. It doesn't have any of those other features. Um, it will show a Manhattan plot of that data set specifically and the top associations from that data set specifically, because we know a lot of people like to replicate their association results in a particular data set. Um, so let's see. And then uh, finally, global enrichments. So this, these are the Gregor results that I talked about. Um, so for example, um, this, um, okay. So you can filter, um, th this shows all of the different um, annotations that have been uh, run through Gregor and you can filter um, the table to show any of them. You can also do multiple annotations if you like. You can select one and then select another and uh, you know it's very very versatile. You can X these out or add them. Um, and then yeah the method is the, um, the way that the original annotations were processed. You can filter by that. Um, tissue filtering yeah, this is something we're working on because this is a very long list and it's not even in alphabetical order right now, but we are going to have a much better way to navigate those tissues. Um, and so on, you can, nav you can uh, filter by ancestry, p-value, and fold. Um, so that is a quick overview of the phenotype page. Um, and now I want to go to, okay, let's go back home. Um, we realize that many people who come to the portal are going to want to, to start from a gene. They're interested in a particular gene or the region of a gene. So um, you can type in a gene name and go to a gene page. And right now, this gene page is a very simple page. It basically links lists and links to um, just information about the gene and it, uh, the gene product and links to external databases. Uh, it doesn't show the associations or annotations, but the way to get to those is to is here. This is the region of the gene. So this link here takes you to a region page that is just the coding sequence of the gene. And if you want to look at the gene plus flanking regions, you can click on this link. So let's do this extend by 50 KB. And um, let's just extend it by another 50 KB. So here is the region. Um, with 100 KB of flanking sequences on either side of this gene, sort one. The phenotype here um, that's shown by default is the phenotype for which there are the most significant associations in this region. And the phenotype shown here determines the phenotype that is shown in the um, locus zoom plot here and in the table below it of top associations. Now, if you want to look at a different phenotype for this region, you can just click on this, select phenotype, and then again, um, start typing in any uh, text and you get a selection of the phenotypes that you can change to. And if you change the phenotype, um, the, the locus zoom plot and the table of top associations will change. But let's go back to LDL cholesterol. Um, okay, um, this section right below is meant to summarize all of the most significant associations across this region. And we're still working on this display too. We have a couple of alternative ways to look at it. In this view, um, this top section here with the graph um, shows the, the traits um, that are associated at genome-wide significance with variants in this region. And these are color-coded by the, the phenotype category um, for each phenotype. And um, we have an alternative visualization here for the genome-wide significant variants um, 
which groups them by overall groups. So it's easy to see, you know, what kind of phenotypes are most uh, significant in the region. And then if you want to look at individual phenotypes within a group, you can expand and, and see them all. So that's, that's kind of, um, I think this is a nice visual, visualization. I like this one. <laughs> um, here um, below in these yellow bubbles, this shows all of the traits that are associated at le um, less than genome-wide significance. And you can see them all in this enormous display here. We have so many traits. So, um, okay, so uh, locus zoom, I'm sure you're all familiar with. This is the, the classical visualization for geneticists. This is um, uh, also uh, created by our colleagues at University of Michigan. Um, and you can, you can click on a variant and um, you can make it the, the reference for linkage disequilibrium, which is kind of nice. Um, it's, here's a legend for color coding. So you can see that like the red variants are the ones um, with, a, with a high, um, with high LD with that, that variant. Um, you can also pan on the locus zoom display and you can zoom in and out by holding shift and scrolling. It's very responsive. Hey, Maria. Yeah. Can we move to the, just be, I'm just sensitive to time. Why don't we move to the um, region explorer and variant prioritize if you could? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So um, the top associations below locus zoom just um, lists those associations that are shown and it's filterable in the same way. Okay. So here is the region explorer. Um, and this is a new visualization. Um, it's based on the interact, uh, yeah. Um, interactive Genome Viewer, IGV. Um, and this is a way to display credible sets and annotations uh, run through Gregor um, and um, to, to really get an idea of what's going on in the region. So first, let's add a credible set. If you click in here, you'll be presented with the credible sets that are available in the region. It could be more than one, and you can choose one. So here, um, there's actually only one variant in this credible set with very high posterior probability. Um, and now annotation methods, are these are all the methods that I talked about before. Um, and let's add um, an active enhancer, just to show you. So we get a track. I'm just gonna add another track here and then I'll explain what we're looking at. Let's add um, the ABC track. Okay, so... Um, okay, so all of these colors, each color represents a different tissue. So these blocks represent the extent of annotations um, that are associated with, um, in different tissues, Are each color is different tissue. Um, and let's um, zoom in a little bit so we can see what we're looking at. So let's move this variant we're interested in to the middle. Um, and let's zoom in some. So we can maybe read these labels better. Um, okay, now a really nice thing about this display is that um, because all of these annotations are processed through Gregor, they have um, p-values for the significance of the enrichment, and they also have a fold value for the fold enrichment. So we can filter um, to, to um, decrease, um, to see more specific information. So here we filtered by twofold enrichment and a, and a p-value threshold. We can put the crosshair on the variant and see. So this, this phenotype we're looking at is LDL cholesterol. And you can see that for both of these um, methods, um, it, there are, um, the variant does overlap with some liver, liver cell line tissue. So that's, that's consistent with what we know. Actually, yeah, both because the liver is a, an uh, epicenter of cholesterol metabolism. Also, uh, this variant in particular is not just a random variant, it's one that is known to affect um, liver-specific uh, regulation. So, um, okay, so this is the, um, basically uh, um, how this works, and there's a lot of interactivity. You can, um, you can customize these tracks. Um, you can, you know, add as many as you want. And of course, you have the gene, uh, the genome map down here, where you can see uh, genes and isoforms. So um, this is a really versatile thing, and it can help you um, decide 
um, of course, okay, there's only one variant here, but in many, most credible sets, there would be many variants, and it can help you decide which variant um, might be the most interesting to look at further. And now um, there is a link here to another visualization that uh, we're calling the Variant Prioritizer, and this was developed at the Broad by um, Leah Petronio and Noam Shoresh. And it's, um, it has this, all of the same data that we were looking at, um, and it's, it covers the same region that we just came from. But it's, it's just an alternative way of looking at these data. And um, this is very much a prototype, and we're, we're um, trying to figure out how to best to integrate it with the visualization, visualization that I just showed you. So um, it's, I'm not going to spend much time on, on the details of this. Um, but I'll just say that it, it, it um, shows all of these methods that we've just been talking about. And for example, here's the sort one gene that we started with. So if you mouse over it, you can see um, all a, of the lines of evidence that link this variant that we're interested in with the gene and in which tissues and by which method. So again, it can help you prioritize um, which variants or which genes you are interested in, in um, looking at or which tissues might be most interesting to work with. Um, and that's all I'm going to say about that. And then very quickly, I'm going to show another new um, uh, tool that we have that was developed um, in our group by Oliver, Oliver Rubenacher, and that's called Lunaris. And the link to it is up here on the region page. So we realize that many people don't really want to browse results in a portal. They just uh, want to get um, a file of something and, and play with it themselves. And this, this is for those people. Um, so for example, um, okay, I'm going, um, Linaris is still under development and it doesn't have data for all phenotypes. I'm going to switch us to a phenotype that it does have data for, which is BMI. Now, if you're on this page, you can download data with Linaris. And this will show you um, all of the variants in this region that are associated with BMI. And you can just copy this and paste it into a file of your own and, and have these data to play with very quickly and easily. Now, Lunaris also has an interface um, it, for, for more options. And here's the link to get there. Um, I've already loaded it here um, because there's so much information, it actually takes a little bit to load. Um, so we're working on making this more user-friendly. There is a nice documentation page, um, but uh, let me just quickly give you the idea here. You can um, click on this to get the, the code for various queries, and then you can, you can edit them. You can click in here and change the region if you want and so forth. And so this, um, this query was for um, just all the variants in a region, and it was the region that we were just looking at on the page. And then when you're the results you can do submit request and get results uh, this is just the file header for the result file so uh, you can see that it, it gives you a ton of information a lot of this comes from the variant effect predictor it has variant effects it has uh, conservation scores um, it's got a, a ton of things um, so this is this can be useful if you just want to know everything about the variance in a region um, another query that you can do um, is this region and trait. This is, and this is what we saw on the previous page. So you've got the region and the phenotype, and you can, you can edit this if you like um, to another phenotype and submit the request. And then you will very quickly have um, all of a list of the variants that are associated for here in this example with T2D in the region. So this is um, really nice for people who, who just want a lot of data. And um, this is also available um, as a workspace in the Terra platform, which is a cloud-based cloud -based data delivery platform. Um, so I think that is about all I want to say, and I'll leave a few minutes for questions. But I just, before I close, I want to say that um, we would love your feedback. And um, on the CMDKP or on any of the portals, there is this help button. And then there's a contact form where you can uh, very quickly just send us um, a question or hopefully a suggestion. We'd love to have your feedback about all of these, um, all this, you know, the whole beta site, uh, anything you'd like to tell us. Okay, um, I think I'll stop there and let's take some questions. So a couple points, Maria, thank you. Um, so the, the Linaris um, app, if you will, it's really response to computational um, collaborators like um, Jesse Engrates and Melina Klausnitzer who have a method and they want to use 
the integrated resource that Maria just mentioned, the, all the genetic data, the GWAS data, and all the annotations to run their method. So this is a very simple way that you can get access immediately to the matrix of genetic associations and annotations that are relevant for what method you might want to run. And you can select specific variants if you only want those, as Maria mentioned. So this is really a, an arc to get towards a computational um, set of users, whereas the variant explorer and the region explorer that was built that really has this elegant you know way of integrating annotations from dga and allows you to visualize them is really for someone who is more on the experimental side or in industry who says i have a genomic reason and i want to know you know what tissue what variant i might want to you know functionally follow up so there's sort of two access mechanisms really trying to make it accessible through the the platform um, so that's kind of why those both those and those will be those will develop in tandem as the resource grows. So we're hoping that you know, we can respond to different types of users this way a little bit more broadly. Are there questions? I think I've seen some questions in the chat, so we've addressed all of them. Um, if anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask questions, we have a couple minutes for that. Um, and I'll just do some closing notes if there's no questions. I'll give a pause. You can unmute yourself, I believe, right, Allie? <laughs> we want to be able to hear your voices. Well, with that, um, a couple of things. So we're gonna have another webinar in September. Um, in between now and then, we will have a live launch of the, the Common Metabolic Disease Knowledge Portal. And really, and one important note is that the other production portals, musculoskeletal, and hopefully soon to launch after that, the lung, will also be converted over to this framework in due time as we work with the collaborators to make sure that you know, all of the content is lifted over, all the features that are really important to that particular community are handled in the new framework. The goal is really here to make sure that they're all in the same suite, same tools, features, access mechanisms, but they're specific to the disease community that they represent. Um, and we hope that, that will be of value to everyone. Um, any other questions? So please play with it. Tell us if you don't like it, tell if you like it. Um, we're gonna actively be developing this with you know, Kyle's team at DGA and um, with our, our collaborators at Michigan who developed Locusum and you know, all of the other ways to, to visualize data with us. So um, I want to thank everyone for their time. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to email us afterwards. I realize it's time, so I'd like to end on time for everybody. Um, thank you, Maria. And um, anything else before we close? All right. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Have a wonderful afternoon.